Hello, I'm Gudrun the Wright. I'm a copywriter, content marketer and a history enthusiast. I'm so pleased you've chosen to watch my presentation. I hope you enjoy it and you get a lot out of the All About That Place event. So, using the public house to inspire your one place study. I think that if you want to learn more about a particular place, there are two buildings that are worth investigating. The first is the parish church, which is especially handy if they have meticulously kept records of all the births, marriages and deaths. And the other is the local pub. Now, while they're unlikely to have much in the way of written records, you can often find out enough about their histories to inform you about the wider area. Tall tales and apocryphal stories told around the bar will have kernels of truth, and they might help you find out more about family legends. If generations of your relatives have lived in the same area, which is quite likely, then somebody in the pub will probably know of them. Look out too for photos on display, groups of workers having a day out in a horse and cart, father and son or mother and son owners of the local butcher, women on doorsteps and kids in the back lanes. All of these can help you to really get a sense of the place and those within it. And finally, the closure or demolition of the pub will also inform your research. Pubs are forced to close when there aren't enough people to justify them being open. So what does that tell you about your ancestors? If the work on the doorstep dried up, where did they go? What sort of jobs did they do instead? So, with all of that in mind, I'm going to tell you a bit about the area that the paternal side of my family are from, Bilkey, on the south side of the River Town, Tyne, in the north of England. We're going to use one of the only two pubs still standing as our focus point, the Cricketers Arms, and imagine my ancestors relaxing in the lounge or propping up the bar after a hard day's work. Now today's pub, which you can see here, is in a very traditional style. There's a bar on one side and a lounge area on the other. And the pub interior is actually one big room, with the horse-shaped bar allowing access from several points. There's also an alco alcove with a dartboard and a little platform for the pool table. The jukebox and open fire complete the look. And my great-great-grandmother's house was next door to the pub, which no doubt gave a great excuse for just popping out for one. Uh, the Cricketers Arms dates to 1868 and was once one of 13 pubs in the area. The pub is made of local sandstone and today is all that's left of the street, which is known as Joel Terrace. Previous incarnations of the pub were called the Key Tavern in the early 80s and previously as the Cromwell. And a book on South Tyneside pubs tells us that a Mrs Jane Wynne advertised the pub as the Board Inn in 1850, and then 15 years later she called it the Letter Board Inn, and by 1873 she'd renamed it again to the Key Tavern. So, who would the customers have been at the Board Inn or the Key Tavern, and what can that tell us about the local area? We know that the streets that once stood around the pub were home to the families working in coal and shipbuilding. My family were shipbuilders. So it's reasonable to assume that men from both professions would have been regulars. The pub is on a hill that leads up from the shipyard, so most would pass it on their way home. However, there was also a glassworks nearby, which was established in the early 1800s, along with the paint and colour works, the Cooperative Wholesale Society Cabinet Works, and Alkali and Lead Works. But before that, many local men and boys would have been keelmen, who worked on large boats, or keels, taking coal from both sides of the Tyne and the Weir out to the collier ships for transportation south. The rivers were shallow, so long, flat bottom boats were necessary in order to move up and down. Coal was first transported on the Tyne in the mid-13th century, and those early keelmen would have found it back-breaking labour. The boat was moved with a long oar, and they took turns to propel it. Coal is recorded as being exported from the Weir in 1396. Of course, the keelmen also had to load and unload the coal and work long days. They tended to live just outside the city walls of Newcastle, so it is possible that the Bilkey residents relocated, but it's more likely that they worked in Wearside, which also would have been a bit closer. The river transportation of coal eventually died out with the introduction of the railways in the 19th century. Oh, and the picture, by the way, is Turner's Keelman Heaving Coal by Moonlight from 1835. So... Apart from work, what might the pub goers have talked about? The men at the bar might have talked about football and the women in the snug, about the latest film showing at the cinema, when there was a cinema of course, or share things overheard in the general store. And yes, these are possibly stereotypes, but there would have been a gender divide in the pub at least. So there's probably a 50-50 split over which team people in Bilkey would have supported when it comes to football. 
Proximity to St James's Park would lead you to think that they favoured Newcastle United. The team was founded in 1890. However, Gateshead was once part of Durham rather than Northumberland, along with Sunderland. And then their AFC team was founded in 1879 and was very successful in the 1890s. Of course, the residents of Bilkey might have also supported a smaller lower league team. Gateshead's own team didn't start until 1977, but before that there were clubs throughout County Durham. And in fact, West Auckland, who still play today, were the first winners of the World Cup in 1909. We also know that days out were arranged, starting off from one of the local pubs, and with people working such long hours and demanding jobs, these were probably very popular. Depending on the plans, they may only go a couple of miles down the road to visit another pub, or as far as the coast, and South Shields would probably be the most likely from Bilkey. And no doubt there was probably plenty of gossip and chattering about local scandals too. As well as the pub, Joel Terrace is infamous for the home of the murdered seven-year-old Mary Ina Stewart, who was killed in August 1902. Now, Mary was one of six children, and she'd gone to visit her uncle one Saturday while her dad was at work in Hexham, which is quite a few miles from Bilkey. Her father, James Stewart, instigated a search for his daughter when he got home late from work and realised that she was missing. So, James rallied the police and his neighbours and they spent quite some time looking for his daughter Mary and the search continued until the following Monday when a second search in the grass at an unused brickyard found Mary's body. 23-year-old Cartman, Thomas Nicholson, was soon arrested for the crime. It was believed that he had hit her over the head, raped and then throttled her. Nicholson claimed that he'd been in the Mason's Arms, one of the other local pubs, until closing time, but witnesses said he'd left at 6.30. When the police searched his room, they found a bloodstained pocket knife with a bloodstained coat and shirt. Many witnesses claimed that they'd seen him wandering around various parts of Bilkey, and there didn't really seem to be any other suspects. Interestingly, the judge who tried Nicholson at the Durham Assizes some months later said that the evidence was circumstantial and there were a number of discrepancies. One discrepancy was that there was no evidence that Mary had actually been raped. However, just to make things more confusing, the judge actually added, he did believe that Nicholson was guilty, but the evidence wasn't as clear as a jury would need in order to convict a murderer. Nicholson was hanged anyway, and not long after his conviction, the police reported that on the night of Mary Stewart's murder, Nicholson had attempted to entice another little girl away. There's not actually much evidence about that, but he's uh, he's been framed as a or identified as a murderer, and so he probably seems like a like a bit of a bad guy. <laughs> so Mary Stewart was laid to rest in the nearby uh, St Mary's Churchyard, which is in Heworth, which is about a mile mile and a half from Bilkey. This isn't a picture of Mary's grave. This is allegedly the grave of a pirate, um, but I wanted to include it because St Mary's Churchyard has some really interesting um, graves and tombs and memorials, including um, some First World War uh, graves and also a memorial to some miners who were killed. And St Mary's is probably the the church where most people from, from Bilkey would have been buried because the, the churches there are too small to have graveyards of their own. So that is just a very quick tour of um, Pilkey. I haven't covered the, the park or the, the local community farm or anything like that, but I hope it's given you a little bit of an insight into what working class life would have been like in the north of England in the 1800s and even earlier. And I also hope it's inspired you to do some research about um, the area that your family is from and particularly the local pub or pubs that they would have been regulars in. Thank you so much for listening. Um, If you have any questions, comments, anything you'd like to follow up with me on, I am in the um, special All About That Place Facebook group. You can find me, come and tag me, and I'm more than happy to talk about the history of the northeast of England, Bilkey and Gateshead. Thank you.